Okay, so uh, with us today, uh, we have Marcus Raiden, and uh, during various roles over the last uh, 22 years, management uh, and uh, IT leadership, and Marcus is now the Director of Integration and Data Management at Devry University. Uh, we also have uh, Glenn Donaldson, who's been working uh, at various technical and leadership roles uh, within the university for the past 25 years. Uh, Glenn is now uh, the Director of Application Architecture at Ohio State University. And last but not least, uh, we have George Kopf with 30 plus years uh, experience in the IT industry, uh, including startups and multinational companies. And George is now a Director of and Architect at Princeton University. And joining me from WSO2 is uh, Nuan Badera, um, who's got uh, a wealth of experience in software development and working closely with our customers over a variety of industry sectors, including education. Um, so um, Nuon has uh, also got the dubious uh, honor of having to put up with me for the last two and a half years at WSO2. Uh, and he's also a uh, Senior Director of Solution Architecture uh, at the company. So that's um, some brief introductions. Um, and uh, we'll, we will... Uh, kick on. So uh, just to try and uh, set the scene a bit, um, going to get some feedback from the panel on sort of where they are in their digital journey and what sort of approach uh, to digital uh, transformation that they've taken. Uh, so if we can start with, uh, with George, uh, if you can uh, give us an overview of where you are and what you're doing at the university uh, with regards to the digital transformation. So um, thank you everybody for showing up. This is uh, uh, going to be entertaining and fun, I think. So Princeton University um, has an initiative to modernize and use best practices for how we share data, uh, both to make it programmatically maintainable as well as secure and understandable. So I guess it was two, two and a half years ago, we started looking into the different API platforms available. We selected WSO2 and we have built our entire WSO2 platform in-house. So we are running the API manager and the enterprise integrator in-house on our own platform and integrating with a myriad of different applications and replacing a bunch of different existing protocols from DB links to flat file transfers to old SOAP web services. Cool, thank you very much, George. Um, and uh, can we, Marcus, um, I know you've uh, just recently uh, joined Devra University. Can you give us a, an overview of what sort of programs are in, uh, in, in place uh, with your university? Uh, you're on mute, Marcus, sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, um, yes, you're correct. I joined DeVry only recently, but um, as you might know, we actually went through a divestiture and that enabled us really um, to modernize our um, technology. And we chose WSO2 um, as a technology to help us um, provide that data to our business functions more fastly through cloud APIs and agile processes. And so we rolled out WSO2 to actually have a common um, um, enterprise modernization effort for mainly data, but also for a portal initiative um, that actually enables really then fast access to information through APIs. Cool, thank you very much. Um, no one, as I said, you've worked with uh, various organizations, uh, uh, educational organizations uh, in your, your time at WSO2. Uh, is there any particular trends or um, approaches that you're seeing uh, commonly in this in this space? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think when when you when you work with universities, it's always interests me the most because uh, universities deals with like multiple types of systems uh, that that we as solutions architect never get to use, never get to you know work with. You know, if you take healthcare or banking, it's not the same case. When you work with a university, you work with uh, systems in a medical medical school or uh, engineering school. So it, it's completely different how the how the integration protocols work, right? Uh, so so that's completely different. So the solutions that we have to bring together is different from um, from one school to another, and how you can you know mix and match the data. And above all, certain you know, certain schools have their own policies, you know, from the governance aspects. 
uh, th that's that's again uh, a challenge. You know, some schools want to keep their data very uh, in a protective way. They have their own policies how to share data, how to share with the government uh, for different research aspects, etc. So, uh, so the the solving the integration challenge is one, and then solving the governance challenge is another aspect, in particular in the in the university education industry. Oh, uh, I can see Marcus uh, nodding away, uh, agreeing with you there. <laughs> well, the point is this, right? An API strategy is not just um, in the way of um, protecting data, it's actually enabling to get to satisfy, for example, CCPA requirements and much faster because we can not only gather information faster, but also um, help with deletion requests because we already have the integration methods then um, into various applications. And so it really allows us to satisfy new scenarios that we didn't consider um, a long time ago much faster through having a component-based architecture. Thanks. Now, I, I, you know, I've not been through digital transformation in the education space, but I'm sure, assume, uh, in, uh, as in many other uh, industry verticals, there, there are definitely some of the sort of key challenges that you have. Uh, Glenn, could you sort of elaborate on uh, it, what you would consider the sort of the, the key challenges and stuff you've had about doing uh, um, uh, the digital transformation at uh, Ohio State? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as I said, I'm Glenn Donaldson from Ohio State. Um, just a brief background so we can get into the problem. I used to manage the student information system. so obviously folks want to get a lot of data out of that system. So that's what pushed me into this, this, this field, integration and enterprise architecture. Given that we, like George, are also looking at that way of sharing data across the campus in a more secure, efficient fas fashion. And we've been on WSO2 um, for a number of years. Um, we're actually uh, more into the Kubernetes kind of thing, which we might get into. However, given that we are doing this type of platform, it's not really the platform that is the challenge. It is the skills that we don't have at the university or in, out in the workforce, trying to pull in that pipeline of skills in order to do the basic integrations. So that's where one of the biggest challenges is we face. We have folks that are knowledgeable in-house, but we also have legacy folks that are trying to become integration developers, doing the ERP implementations like PeopleSoft and Workday, but they don't have those new skills or would I say more advanced skills to think about integrations in a different way. So I'm going to I'm going to say that I want to thank Glenn. The last time we had a conversation in that New York summit, you were talking about the training that you were giving to your uh, to your people. And so we followed your example and have put together a comprehensive introduction to integrations and how to code in WSO2 so we could push that development effort, make it self-service for the people who need the data. So I don't know if you want to expand on that. We're copying your idea, and it was a very good one. <laughs> sure. Um, given that we had the issue of getting folks up to speed, in the beginning, it was my team doing all the building of the integrations. Well, that's not going to last, especially at a university and if you have a small team. So in order to speed up the adoption of learning about the integrations, adopting the standards around integrations, we start doing little training sessions and teaching each of the development groups like the SIS developers, the HR, finance, and then spreading that knowledge out amongst the groups and then allowing them to use the platform that we have established as their central integration point. So we've made some headway there. We've taught the Workday team to do their own integrations in WSO2 and um, also the PeopleSoft legacy folks. So we made some headway there. However, 
we're coming fast and furious with more and more requests. So we need more resources. <laughs> so have you taken any other um, in that sort of space of trying to uh, enable others to, to um, almost self-serve and, and, and build their own integrations? Is there any other approaches other than getting them sort of trained up? Um, any other technical approaches you've used around making sure that um, there's any frameworks or, or patterns to follow or things like that? So um, I belong to a group called ITANA, which is IT Architects in Academia. So that group has a lot of practices and best uh, best practices and documents and things that can be shared in presentations. So there's other universities that you can lean on to um, gain the different methodologies. One school might be doing CICD like Princeton is doing, or other schools might be doing data management in the warehouse space, but all of that together has integration involved in it. So learning from others is a big, a big way of getting that, that training across. Excellent. Um, George, have you, in your process, you know, obviously skills uh, is, a, is a key thing when delivering the, these, these platforms and the, this transformation. Uh, is there any other challenges that you faced um, in your journey? So we have a practice of uh, digging in and then refactoring as necessary and then digging back in and refactoring as you learn. And it's, um, it is the path to, you know, the best practice, the elegant solution, but it's also a little cumbersome, frustrating and challenging for the people who are constantly refactoring. And on that note, um, we are doing a very, what I would say, rigid CICD process for our WSO2 development. We put all the tools in place and 90% of our training is just how to live in the ecosystem. It's, you know, it's how to understand the archetype that we've developed for, you know, the base code for our APIs and then the process to get that into development and the requirements for the testing, the automated testing, the documentation, all that environment around it is the part that we had to create from scratch and then polish and polish and polish in an iterative way and then finally take that out to the rest of the university. That was the heavy lifting that we did that is going to enable uh, the rest of the university to take advantage of this. But I do want to say one other thing that's interesting is word of mouth is really not fast enough to get what's going on, the change out there. And I had a conversation with the library and they needed some data. And I said, we can build you an API. And they said, well, we don't want to be dependent on you. And I said, we can train you to build your own API. And you could see the ambivalence, <laughs> the challenge of learning something new and the control and flexibility of doing it themselves. And some people went, yeah. And other people went, no. <laughs> so... <laughs> Until the university, you know, until it becomes more of a standard accepted practice, there's going to be this little ripple effect trying to figure it out. Nice. So there's obviously, uh, you know, going to be many more, more challenges than that. And it's, you know, it can be quite a, a, a difficult uh, uh, journey and seem, you know, some of these challenges are quite, it can be quite hard to overcome. Um, Marcus, is it worth it? What do, you, oh, what do you see coming out of it? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's absolutely worth it. I mean, it's hard, but it's worth it. Um, so what it allows is actually having an API catalog with access to data will enable really much faster integration of information into various business pro uh, processes and composing really new use cases much faster from a development perspective and actually reduce cycle times from a delivery perspective. Um, well, so it's definitely worth it um, following an API-led architecture, but it's also hard. Um, it's hard because when you think about someone that is used to batch integration and getting a CSV file um, that he uses for reporting and replicates into his own um, systems, that's easier, right? There's a steep learning curve involved for um, some people, at least, that um, are not familiar with this and have used to old patterns. And that's what we can help actually support them in uh, making sure that 
um, it just does need, not need to be hard for them to consume APIs. We can actually help from an IT perspective. Um, the other thing that um, I wanted to point out is it really is like both Glenn and George mentioned, it's a different mindset in the developers, right? Making sure that you actually um, have the, when you actually start designing your architecture, that you first of all look at what can I reuse? How can I be more nimble by actually reusing existing components and thereby actually deliver results faster? Um, that is something that first of all has to be educated by providing, as I said, catalogs, but also by providing training. And that's where, quite frankly, we are not focusing on infrastructure and we are not focusing on uh, maintaining our own architecture. We're using the WSO to, uh, WSO to um, manage services in this case, to manage the infrastructure on our behalf so that we can instead focus then um, on our initiatives um, and uh, building new capabilities for the organization. Cool, thanks, Marcus. Um, Actually, George, I just had one thought about one of the things you said before. You've got a, a, a good framework set up that your developers can work within and create their APIs. And um, with some views on sort of agile methodologies and agile working, and I've, I've, I've had some experiences before in, in the public sector in the UK, um, do people complain it's too restrictive that they can't, use what they want to use that they can't you know uh, do their own thing in an agile uh, manner or do you come up across any issues like that so no and what we're seeing instead it's the field of dreams approach to you know development build it and they will come so what we did is we created a terminal server that is the WCO2 sandbox that they can develop in before they get to the shared development environment, they can run inside this um, server that has the API manager, the enterprise integrator, it has its own database, it has SQL developer, notepad, it has the entire ecosystem. It has Postman, it has you know everything that they're gonna wanna use. And then the training we actually give them the presentation that we file for the training and they can step through and see how all these different tools are used in this environment. And then they get to keep it. The training, they train in this environment and then that's what they're gonna develop in. And so the easiest path to success is to use this environment, to use these tools and to create something inside of our rigidly defined pipeline. To step outside of that, you'd have to start inventing things. And then, well, things wouldn't work. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, so obviously, there's been a lot of uh, changes recently in the, uh, the the situation globally with the pandemic and lockdown, etc. Um, Glenn, have you seen any changes um, in uh, any requirements or behaviours uh, due to? The, the current situation? So for my team and myself, I don't think our behaviors have changed. And luckily we have a platform set up that just works and that we've um, expanded its capability. We have it in Kubernetes and Docker and things like that. So there's no failures or if there are, it restarts itself. But from a work perspective and request, it's increased because more people want access to data. For example, um, courses, teachers had to go and put courses online. Only 50% were online before, or maybe even less. Now all of it's online, but they needed access to those, that information to make syllabuses and to make course guides and put the course out there online in our LMS and things like that. So we got requests for that. There's other ERP still in flight. And because we're remote, instead of having that, hey, stop, we'll get to you in a moment if they walk up to you at your desk, all the requests are flooding in. But luckily we have a platform and as Marcus was talking about that reuse, that's something that we strive to get and create the, based on design, the services and APIs that could be reused 
So we could answer requests more quickly just by go to our API store. Here is a person service, here is a core service, here's department and organization service. So it's really been the increase in requesting data and how they get it. But it's also, I would say, helping our cause because the more that we satisfy these cases, you're getting small wins with big impact. Cool. Thanks, exactly. Um, Marcus, are you seeing similar behaviors or are you seeing anything uh, different in your uh, organization due to current demands? I can, I can, I can fully support Glenn. I mean, definitely. I mean, the importance of getting fast visibility and into many into, hey, how is our new enrollments doing? How is persistent changing? Right. This is these are aspects that, of course, for universities are extremely important. Right. And having the visibility into data is uh, more important than ever. Now, we've always been a data-driven organization and uh, made um, early on. Um, the journey into the cloud to build out a cloud-based data lake, which um, now actually um, has been proven very valuable for ourselves. And it's an effort that we are accelerating to get more data into the cloud so that um, no one has to go to the on-premise data center at present, <laughs> and which um, was really valuable for ourselves and actually also helped with um, connectivity and other issues um, that we would normally face with when connecting to on-premise data. Oh, that's that's really good to hear. Um, Nuon, are you uh, with with any of the other institutions? Um, is there any other sort of uh, situations occurring or uh, demands occurring, or you know how how to um, how they're sort of reacting to the current uh, uh, situation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the trend that I've I've, uh, I've been you know monitoring and seeing is that a lot of projects that been in the back burner is coming live again. So um, uh, that's something kind of fascinating as well, because when, when I as a solutions architect work with some of the customers, uh, they say, okay, uh, we don't need to secure that platform with all and proper API security, we'll just use VPN and expose it uh, within the school because this system is never meant to be accessed outside. But that whole thing is changed now, right? Every system needs to be accessed from outside. So, so, so I think most of those projects that push to the backbone, okay, we'll take it later, are coming live again and, and people are finding solutions. So there are systems that built, that's never meant to be accessed from outside. So they have been redesigning, re-architecting. So there's a lot of revamping happening there. The other thing that I, I saw is that um, also uh, help, help the local school on this. Uh, these are not, you know, high-end universities that have, you know, five years, six years uh, IT strategies small schools uh, that they want to, you know, do the day-to-day -day schooling, day-to-day -day tests, et cetera. So they want to do like a proper track. They want to monitor the kid and, and, and run a small test within, within, uh, within the home. So they, they look for systems like that, like things like device management, you know, how, how do you monitor if a tab is opened in your machine, um, if it's not an open book exam, things like that. So, so people are looking for those kind of systems. So I think there is a boom in that area. Where, uh, how do you innovate? So certain some of these problems are already solved uh, with you know major platforms like Coursera, edX, uh, but it's not widespread. So so I think it's a it's a big movement. Okay. So that you know thing that sort of rings in my head when you're talking about exposing systems that haven't and things accelerating. Um, is there any uh, and this is to, to anyone really uh, seeing any sort of uh, security challenges or worries in, in, in the space uh, coming up now. Um, so, yeah, in, in my experience, what I saw is that that VPN. So that's a very common thing. Like people want to expose their system through a VPN or a jump box or something like that. Uh, so people can access it. It is fine. If you are inside the school, you don't have to protect those systems. Uh, but then there are standard mechanisms of how to expose these systems outside world using proper mechanisms, uh, you know, like using token, single sign-on mechanisms, all kind of protocols. So implementing those, I, I'm seeing. But I, I believe, you know, Glenn, uh, George, Marcus, all three of you guys have thought about it, you know, five years before. When I worked with Glenn, initially we, we thought about you know integrating shibboleth with uh, api management and do single sign on issuing tokens etc maybe you guys can ex uh, you know explain a little bit more on that 
Oh yeah. Um, we thought about security from the get go, given that our uh, CISO is involved in a lot of things and we started a, uh, what is control controls program. So each of the departments have to adhere to certain controls, right? And part of that is the sharing of data and protecting the data and not duplicating the data. So the more we had services, the more security backed us because we'd have APIs and they're protected via the SHIB with a login to get to the store or because it's through the SSL protocols, things like that. Um, we have what's called S1 through S4, private and public data. Those are all classified, but the more and more we put them into APIs, the more and more security felt comfortable because folks aren't duplicating the data, they're using the data. So, thanks. So we're protecting access to our APIs in the store using Active Directory groups. And so from my point of view, from the technical side of it, you know, it's locked down. We're very happy with the security. Um, the question comes when somebody comes and asks me for an API, do they have permission to get that data? Who is the original data owner that can say, yes, this person has the ability to use it for that use case. And to make that more streamlined, oh, it's one thirty. Um, to make that more streamlined, Princeton has embarked on a data governance effort to make sure that we understand who is the owner of all the data and who would be allowed to use it in what use cases. So that's going to help us basically with the chasing around and trying to get permission for people to access the data. Cool. No, that's, that's something that, you know, sometimes isn't considered because you just looked at it from a, um, a technical perspective initially of, yeah, we can, we can throw that data out there, but should you throw that data out there is a different, different question. Cool. Thanks a lot. From a technical okay. point of view, like there are protocols associated and mechanisms associated on implementing those kind of things, like, you know, policy-based access control is essentially we are trying to solve like an authorization problem. Uh, how do you delegate access and uh, how do you expose those API uh, and data attributes exposed from those APIs? So you can engage policies in the in on in flight when when API call happens to a gateway. We can inspect that and then check whether okay this person who's accessing this uh, particular data set has access to uh, this data set. Cool. That's cool. Um, so I think um, a while back, you know, someone mentioned you know we're we're remote working and um, you know uh, a lot of people are uh, uh, you know. Um, have been working at home for a while now. Some might be starting to to go back in various uh, regions around the world. But um, what sort of impacts has that um, had on your sort of operations or the the projects or transformations that have been um, going on? Um, George, uh, is there anything in your space? What what's uh, been going on from the remote perspective? Not so much from the remote perspective, but more from the um, pandemic crisis. There is oftentimes a shorter turnaround time for some integration that needs to happen now. And um, having this you know, API platform in place really is a flexible and powerful tool to make a quick turnaround after we've got all the bureaucracy solved. Um, but other than that, the working remotely, it doesn't seem to be a big impact on, on how we do our business. Cool. Uh, Marcus, were you sort of prepared for this? Were there any, uh, uh, any issues uh, with sort of the lockdown protocols and stuff in your space? No, actually, um, the opposite is the case, right? You don't have people in commute. So <laughs> um, <laughs> as a result of that, um, the productivity definitely has not increased. Um, we, um, we are using, as you know, I mentioned that earlier, we're using managed services, right? So from that perspective, we have still access to all the same resources that we had um, access before. Um, and we are focusing on these new initiatives um, that um, will provide better access to data um, throughout the organization using cloud-based architecture. Um, our portal initiative is um, continuing and 
Um, basically, team collaboration um, is um, like we here over Zoom. We're using similar te technology um, and we're collab continuing to collaborate. Um, really, the pandemic didn't have um, any impact on our activities. What we had to do, of course, like any other organization, is that we um, prepared really um, contingency planning in case that um, anyone got infected and how we would continue our projects. So that was a little bit of more additional effort to make sure that we could, in this case, think about how we would ensure project delivery. But um, fortunately, um, um, everything, um, everyone is healthy and stayed at home. So um, no impact there. <laughs> right. Uh, that's, that's great to hear. Um, Glenn, is there, have you got any sort of similar uh, stories, any advantages or disadvantages from how your um, platform's been sort of designed or architected? No, I don't think anything's changed from that perspective. Like I said, I, going back to the issue or the increase in requests and things like that, and then the worry about a resource like Marcus was referring to, if somebody got sick or not, those kind of worries. But from our platform and the services we're providing, I don't think there's really an impact, except from what I said about being a positive Thing and having those there and more and more people becoming aware because they need it, therefore it increases the visibility of our platform and the services we provide. Yeah, no, that's, that's good because a, a lot of the time the integration uh, stuff becomes the sort of unsung hero of, uh, of services, you know, um, the number of times, you know, you can see great new digital services and UIs and websites but behind the scenes, you've got uh, mm -hmm. a whole ton of people making sure that data is there and <laughs> on time and <laughs> providing that, uh, that service. So no, that's good to hear. Uh, Nuon, what would you, would you consider, you know, to sort of cope in these sort of um, unforeseen scenarios? Um, what would you consider any sort of key aspects to sort of think about to ensure that these uh, platforms and transformation things can, can keep going and be flexible enough um, to, uh, to, to cope with, um, with uh, changes in direction. Right, so I mean, something like COVID is unprecedented in scale, right? So uh, I don't think anybody really expected when designing systems, something like that will ever happen. Uh, but by the end of the day, I think uh, the, 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 the clean best practices based architecture is the, is the savior. Uh, at least that's how I, I feel about it. Uh, there are, I, I see it as a spectrum when, when we talk about enterprise integration. Uh, there are folks who want, you know, enormous amount of flexibility. They want to build their systems from the ground up. Like, you know, folks like Glenn and, uh, and George in Princeton, they build systems from ground up and they're maintaining those systems, uh, you know, Kubernetes plays platforms and maintaining deploying containers, etc. And then the other side of the spectrum is then there are universities who are very comfortable in consuming services, uh, out of the box services from cloud platforms uh, and using them, for example, DevRel. So Marcus can talk about that more. Uh, but end of the day, you have to think about a clean architecture where you, you have your integration in one place where you do integration cleanly, even though you are using cloud systems. Uh, if you're doing point-to-point -point integrations with, you know, with Salesforce and, and, and Workday, you can't bring your third system and, and do another integration if the cost is too high. So, so going with the best practices uh, and, and having a clean architecture laid out from the beginning will certainly give you some uh, you know, leverage for any unforeseen uh, situation. That's, that's how I feel about it. So, um, Marcus, no one mentioned that you're, you have taken approach of using sort of more cloud services. What was, what were the key drivers ar around uh, those sort of uh, decisions or? Well, various, right? Number one is um, leveraging cloud resources instead of um, building on-premise systems and will allow us to um, make use of new capabilities faster and um, allows our team to focus um, as I mentioned, on new data initiatives and, and um, value-added activities instead of um, triaging um, unstable infrastructure and having to worry with um, topics that 
um, typically are related to infrastructure such as capacity planning, high availability and disaster recovery planning. Those topics are still, I don't get me wrong, um, those topics are still relevant when actually dealing with a cloud provider, whether it's um, infrastructure or platform or um, software as a service. So you still want to ask these questions to your vendor to make sure that they are taking care of it. The ongoing going operations effort, however, is, is smaller and um, the ability to actually leverage new services is faster. Um, an example, for example, thinking about um, upgrades, and it's definitely important for ourselves, but instead of performing um, these upgrades ourselves, we can, in this case, leverage your, your resources to actually perform these on our behalf. Similar to security, which was a, a different topic, making sure that we have vulnerability and penetration testing, that actually we have the patches, the security patches applied. Definitely important topics that we are on top of, but we don't have to allocate bandwidth for a very small team um, anyways. Um, yeah. Another aspect, of course, when, when it comes to cloud um, architecture is um, the elastic elasticity of cost, um, when it, not necessarily when you have a managed service um, environment, but when it comes to SaaS environments and the um, plannability, whether it's CapEx, OpEx, right? Those are, so there's financial um, considerations yeah. um, that um, come into the picture. And for us, it was just the um, right decision from um, the size of our organization to actually go cloud-based. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, so one of the things I wanted to sort of dig in quickly just before we move to uh, the Q&A. So if anyone out there has any uh, questions, please do um, put them into the Q&A system or the, I think the chat is open as well. Um, uh, you know, I uh, wanted to sort of uh, ask about, you know, obviously some of the scenarios we've discussed have been around sort of uh, system integration and, and getting access for sort of uh, um, um, materials and, and data from the different departments and faculties. But um, are there, you know, do any of you have any in interactions from the sort of the students directly within the university and how do they, you know, interface into the, the, the integration platform? Um, I'll come to George uh, first on that. Well, we have just started uh talking to students. So um, there is a permanent student created app that um, we built an API for and delivered to them so they could stop screen scraping um, some web pages. But I just started a conversation um, at the end of the semester with the computer science class that does projects as part of their delivery. And we started talking to them about how we can create a stable of APIs that they could use in perpetuity going forward. And the first thing we had to do was educate them about what data they're allowed to get because they immediately wanted um, data that would be restricted. So um, we started that conversation and hopefully over the next several semesters, we'll build out this larger footprint and make their class that much less bureaucratic. Nice, that sounds good. Um, Glenn, do you have anything in your, uh, on your platform that the students interact with? So we have, there's a capstone program that we have for our, at least our computer science engineering group that they take at their last semester. And last year, I think it was the year before, um, we had three students um, interact with us to do a, their engineering capstone. And they actually had no experience in doing web services or APIs or anything like that, let alone our pl platform. But we met with them at the beginning of the semester, worked with them, gave them material that we gave to the other folks that we've trained throughout our organization. And they were able to produce solutions. And matter of fact, they did three solutions for the same problem using the platform. So they were able to learn, learn it. And then they won the best um, project at the end of the thing. And I had to sponsor and meet with their professor at, as well and approve. But what that also brought up is that the computer science courses aren't teaching what we need as integration development 
for DevOps development, things like that. So that pointed out that issue and that we took very smart students and gave them the, the tools to do the work, but they aren't being taught that in a general manner. So yeah. wanting to talk with the curriculum and I started that conversation to start, how can we enter act with them and weave that into part of their coursework. No, that's, that's a, a, a really good point. Cause I must admit, um, I've got a number of, uh, of, of children and when sort of looking at courses and things that they wanted to do or a levels or colleges, I must admit, I wasn't always very impressed with the content, you know, knowing what's needed in the real world some of the content that uh, the, the courses contain this was a few years ago but didn't seem to um, sort of really match the skill sets that are needed so so they're yeah. learning languages and ai or machine learning things like that the high level concepts but the actual learn how to do jenkins get things like that it just depends on the course or the person yeah. in that class, whether they use it or not. It's not necessarily part of the normal coursework. So that's what I found interesting. But we also have student employees that work for our office, which is the office of CIO, and they have access to the store as long as they take our um, institutional data policy course and their manager approves, they have the same access as the other developers. Oh, cool. Brilliant. Okay. Um, right. I think um, we'll uh, move into the Q&A section now. So thanks a lot, guys. Now I'll uh, try and direct the questions to uh, a, appropriate panelists, but feel free to, to jump in uh, on any. Um, for our listeners out there as well, I'm going to also turn on... Uh, a poll just for some very quick poll for just some uh, information so uh, it would be great if you could please fill that in as well and that should be coming up uh, now uh, so let's have a look what questions have we got um, okay uh, we've got uh, a question from Sharon Zhu on do you use API manager in the cloud or on premise if on premise how do you manage the product updates? Um, so I think, uh, George, um, you've got an on-prem on deployment. So we, how do I explain it? We really took our time implementing our platform and we did it all through Puppet code. And every last little bit of it is done through Puppet. And so our patch applications are keeping up to date. Everything is really, really simple. Um, go to the code, make the modifications. We've got dev QA and prod. We do everything exactly best practices by the book. And so far it's been uh, very easy and seamless. But having said that, laying the groundwork, building that puppet code and refactoring throughout more than I'd have to say six, eight months. Um, then there's another question for me about integrating with, with AD. We've got single sign on for access to the store and the publisher through Shibboleth. We've got, um, you know, the AD groups built for, um, uh, accessing the individual uh, APIs with the auth tokens, all that set up um, took quite a bit of work, rework until now we feel like it's very polished. Brilliant. That sounds, that sounds great. Uh, Glenn, you're in a, a sort of a, a container managed uh, mm -hmm. space. How do you handle it, uh, the sort of like the updates and stuff in your space? So we have we have Puppet and all that set up. We also have the Jenkins pipeline. Pipeline. We have our sandbox dev QA prod, and we actually have all the developers work in their play sandbox arena. Then they push it to our GitLab code repository, and then we take it from there and automate the moving between the uh, dev QA and prod. 
And we also do that as well with our infrastructure piece of it. So the patch management, the warm updates, things like that, we do the same thing. It's just a different pipeline. Brilliant. Cool. Sounds good. Uh, got a specific question uh, from Marcus here. Uh, it says, uh, which cloud provider do you use for WC2 managed platform? Are there any dependencies that the managed platform imposes? Uh, is integration with other cloud services, identity, role-based access control straightforward? Uh, oh, wait a minute, that just uh, moved. Uh, straightforward. Uh, and if WC2 handles these integrations, are there many choices? <laughs> That's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, no <laughs> so first of all, we are using AWS as a managed service provider. Um, that's so um, definitely, I mean, that means that we are tied to the capabilities that AWS provides, especially when it comes to, um, for example, load balancing, when it comes to um, capabilities such as uh, making sure that we have availability. That's of course things that you then um, have choices around whether you use network-based, application-based load balancers and also the capacity um, of your services. Um, definitely, um, definitely um, um, working very well for us and also with WSO2, um, the relationship is working well for us. The second question I believe was around the integration landscapes. Now, yes, um, especially when you deal with um, services that are hosted in multiple environments, partially um, on premise, um, partially also through other cloud providers, um, our data lake, for example, is um, using Azure. Um, then that means that we have to actually make sure that the peering between the various environments is ensured. Now, that is something that we, um, of course, have um, are working in partnership then with AWS and our network infrastructure team together to make sure that in a secure way, we actually allow VP VPCs between um, the various cloud providers. So that's really more infrastructure questions. I think I'm missing one part of your question, if I'm not mistaken. Can you remind me again? Uh... So I've lost it again in the list, wait a sec. Um, are there any dependencies that the platform imposes um, and the integration straightforward? The integration is straightforward. Yes, yeah. um, of course there's, um, when, it comes to, when it comes to maintenance schedules, just let's um, talk about um, that for a moment. Of course you're tied to some cases, cloud provider capabilities but it's no different than with any other cloud provider. So if your cloud provider say, decides to change, for example, SSL certificates, of course you're tied to their maintenance schedule and you know, make, make sure that your architecture is resilient enough um, to accommodate um, such changes without um, any impact. And um, it's, I mean, we are, we are regularly monitoring um, operations and SLAs and um, are very satisfied so far using AWS. Brilliant, thank you very much. I hope that uh, answered the, uh, the question there. I've um, got a simple one uh, for all of you uh, to answer, uh, which I'm, I'm slightly interested in as well. What are the uh, sort of uh, respective sizes of your sort of integration uh, teams? Because uh, uh, when I did this in my last role, I think at the peak, mine was about 120 people. <laughs> wow, <laughs> can't even get that close. <laughs> my team is what I call really integration enablement side. I'm also enterprise architecture. So there's only five of us on the team right now. We lost a person. But that, and that's what we've had since the beginning. Obviously, we have enterprise uh, infrastructure and middleware folks helping, but mostly at a server support side of things, but that's about it. That's why it was so important in getting the training out for folks building integrations so we could focus more on the platform things and building out the future. George? Uh, five, um, I would make six. Um, and since we started training people, we've probably trained about 25 so far so but they're not all building apis right now but we've got a bunch of different people in different groups working so it's pretty cool cool and marcus yeah we have three um three resources but then we are working with managed service partners and um to ensure 24 by 7 support um we 
follow the typical ITIL processes. And for that, we have we are leveraging basically system integration partners. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. All right. Uh, let's have a look. What's next? Um, got a question about. Um, you mentioned like demands increased and. Have there been any increases in load that have caused any serious concerns, lag during critical times, if it's linked to sort of any exam systems or things like that? Uh, have any of you experienced any, any issues in that sort of space? We've noticed a lot of usage, but not anything that would impact the systems. We're preparing for getting hit hard when our workday implementation goes live. We're implementing all three HR, finance, and student moving from PeopleSoft. So looking at that and going back to what um, George was saying about training, that workday team is the same size as those 25 that were trained. So that was in addition to the folks that were already there on campus in the different groups. But yeah, that's where I think the performance yeah. hits will come from, if any. Uh, George, Marcus, have you noticed any uh, sort of performance or scaling or? No, actually, um, our systems are performing very well. Um, we are monitoring operations um, very well. We had, just anecdotally, we had one particular API where we um, had an unanticipated peak um, load, and that was when uh, we made um, information around how to request a certain financial aid that was distributed as part of COVID available to um, all of our students at the same time. Um, we anticipated that we would have high demand, but we would not anticipate that high demand. So for an hour or so, we saw um, at that time, um, significant queuing behavior that actually had some performance impact. But that was the only blip that we had <laughs> actually from that architecture, yeah. That's good. Uh, George, so anything on board? So as we've been architecting our solution, we've always been focusing on, you know, best practices, trying to make it as performant as possible, fine tuning the SQL queries, um, using the local transport system, just trying to make it just out of the box as elegant and as fast as possible. And I don't know if it's because of that or, you know, we've got two highly available clustered nodes for everything it has never had the smallest little blip when our students are registering for classes or doing their, you know, um, matriculation online and they do it all at the same time. The system has never even shown a, a, a tiny slowdown. I, I, I will mention just because George reminded me of something, our mobile devices that's increased going to one of the questions about mobile device management. Um, we have Jamf for most of those things. I think that's what it is, pushing out things for our various groups, athletics, regular students, honor students, things like that. However, on that is orientation device or orientation app, the OSU app, which is the normal student app. Those are all using the APIs and it is heavy load during the peak times when students are looking for their courses, looking for their grades, things like that. And how we set up the system now in Kubernetes, if one of the nodes or pods get hit and overloads, it'll just shut down and restart another one. So basically we don't see the issue. Nice, nice. That's good. Uh, how are we doing for time? Have we got a quick one? Um, I think we've, yeah, I don't, I think we've covered most of the questions. Uh, yes, guys, you can see anything uh, on there that you want to uh, tackle. And uh, we've got about 30 seconds. So I think uh, it's probably good to, to, to wrap it up there. So, um, Thank you very much uh, for joining me, Nuon, George, Marcus, Glenn. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I could sit and chat uh, about this stuff uh, for, for ages. Um, but um, 
We'll have to have to come. I'm sure there's uh, people who've got to go for lunch, breakfast, or dinner, depending on where they are in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, again, thank you very much for attending. Really appreciate it, and and, and thanks all our attendees for for joining and listening to us. I hope uh, you found it interesting. Um, and if you uh, want any uh, um, further information, uh, please do reach out uh, via email or our, our website.